Hello and welcome to the UK edition. We've got quite a wide range of stories for you this week. Let's kick off with demonetization. Now it's been over a month since the government announced demonetizing the 500 and the 1000 rupee notes. Lord Meghna Desai was in India while this announcement was made. He now speaks to us on how this has affected people living in India and also to some of us here. It's been over a month now since India demonetized its 500 and 1000 rupee notes. Lord Meghnath Desai was in India when the Prime Minister made the announcement. He believes this is a positive move by the Prime Minister and will help tackle the issue of corruption and black money in the country and the inconvenience faced by the country will return to normalcy fairly soon. I think it's very good that people get the habit of not having too much cash at home. They get the banking habit. I hope our banks become better. But that will put a considerable break on corruption. Because, you know, it's always easy to give bribes in cash. Of course, you can give bribes in gold or whatever it is. It's always easy to cash. And I think that route has been made more difficult. That's one good thing. Where I think the government and the officials uh, uh, missed out wasn't thinking through about availability of new money. I think it was a mistake to make the new money a different length from the old money. And they should also not have uh, printed a 2,000 rupee note, they should have printed a 1,000 rupee note. Lately, NRIs have also been in a state of hesitation on how to convert their rupees brought back from India. And some analysts have said that these petty amounts could actually go upwards to a million pounds. If the NRI here can somehow satisfy the government and the banks, that I presume the High Commission will have to uh, deal with this, then it can be done. I mean, if you can prove it is your legitimate money, then there is no reason why uh, the government should not help. But the government will be very, very careful about uh, accepting that families live up to 100,000 pounds unspent balances. You know, 100,000 pounds is nearly a crore. Uh, you know, <laughs> in the old value of pound. So, you know, 80 lakhs to one crore, you have unspent balances in London, I mean in UK. Yes, it may be true, but it is not a very convincing story. With Karma Wangri in London, this is Vebha Varma for News 18. Now to some lighter matters, or should I say fashionable matters. It's Christmas around the corner and we're in the midst of party season. Mani Kohli, who runs Coop Surat Collection, a very successful fashion brand in the UK, talks to us on the trends to look out for when you decide to hit that party circuit. In the years that I have been formatting the whole fashion trends and collections from my store, I see actually a huge change in the approach of the client base here who want to retain their roots very strongly and yet be able to mingle and merge with the environment. I've been very tuned to what my customer wants because I've been listening on board as to how would they like to be seen here. So if the loud jewel colors like reds, oranges, fuchsias and greens are very popular back home, here we have to mold them. So we need to make them a, more subtle more earthy for them to be able to wear it in this environment. So for me, the colors this year prominently have been more the uh, neutral shades like the champagne, blush pink, um, grays, whether they were light dove gray or the charcoal gray, um, the creams, the ivories we've done away with. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we do the deep garnets and the maroons. Blacks has always been a forerunner because black allows you to merge with everything, I guess, and, and somehow isolate yourself from everyone else in a black. But we've tried to merge black with many other colors so that people have come out and stood out for who they are, where they are. But generally, the environment has said, the client has come back and said, a touch of embroidery would look nice without being it loudly stated. So I've been working on those very strong tailored cuts and fits where the structure is visible as a very 
um, mainstream structure, but the hint of embroidery, a hint of print, a hint of a splash of color, which would be um, more traditional based, is shown in the garment. Dresses, dresses and more dresses. <laughs> People have come now to wearing flares, they've come to wearing uh, jumpsuits a lot, as long as it's just adorned a little bit with embroidery to make it look a little, uh, you know, rooted. Um, but the demand has, has been a lot of dresses. We've actually even gone to the extent of making sari draped dresses. So it it can be worn as a sari when needed with a short blouse or it can be worn with a different shirt or a different jacket and still be looked as a gown which is very fusion, which is more mainstream rather than just keeping it as an, you know, an ethnic outfit. So overall the customer has demanded a change and we've tried to fit in with a cut, very streamlined, tailored look and effect and thrown in that burst of embroidery to make it look a tad bit uh, heritage and rooted. Strangely, we still have sold black as number one, and I think it's going to be very difficult to take black away from anybody's wardrobe. Uh, the other color that has really, really become very popular is the blush pink champagne shade which was always my signature line color, but I'm so happy to see a lot more people wearing it. Uh, it's very, uh, it has a very skin tone nude, nude effect, and it tends to keep people looking very fresh and youthful. The third color, which I feel stands out pretty strong, is the deep burgundy mulberry look, which has done very well for us as well. But these are the three colors which carry a huge palette for anybody who wants to wear them. Flares are actually like trousers, but they have a lot of flair to the bottom. And in the Asian terms, we would call them shararas, and here you would call them flares. Um, jumpsuits tend to be, again, very structured, very well-defined and cut, uh, which which I would say, depending on how they're cut, they need to have a bit more flow rather than very skin fitted. Um, and of course, dresses. Dresses tend to have become such a huge um, uh, acceptable attire in every format because uh, dresses tend to be, I guess, very mainstream as well. So the lengths have been long, the flares have been very, um, you know, the actual cut has been pretty much full. Um, and the drapes we've tried to merge as much as we can within the tailored cellulite so that we can put forward the best foot in the form of fittings and cuts. Speaking to the Christmas flavor, we have a lot of Christians from all across India living here. Let's look at how some of them are going ahead with the festivities for Christmas. The Indian Christian Organization was set up almost 49 years ago to bring together Christians from all across India living in the UK. With the Christmas season upon us, the members meet up for dinners and carol singing and bring an Indian twist to the festive cheer. The Indian Christian Organization was uh, started 47 years ago and the whole idea was to actually get Indians who were moved from India into UK, get together, have some fellowship, have some fun and also along with that we have it is a platform for us to meet new people and extend fellowship outside of the organization itself and on top of that we have a couple of functions over the year one annual dinner a Christmas dinner a picnic and during this time we have a lot of fun and in addition to that we have an opportunity to raise some funds and we support projects back home in India. The members encourage children to be a part of the community and also to understand the cultural roots that they belong to. Carol singing plays a significant part in festivities and they bring a unique touch to this by singing Tamil carols with an Indian touch. So sometimes we explain the situation also in which a carol was composed 
like you know in, in, in villages mostly like in uh, India people kind of have different cultures like it, you know the, the, there could be a community if you are, for are dependent on uh, fishing going into the river or sea to, to do fishing so we actually try to kind of incorporate all the background sounds you know what they do so some people do elelo ailesa kind of in the road boat you know we do all that into the bring all that into the song so people enjoy get the flavor of indian culture and also get a feeling of how a indian christmas is celebrated in the indian village another important aspect of the christmas season is food and here as well they bring a twist to the celebration instead of turkey it's lamb biryani for all the guests with karma wangli in london this is web varma for news 18 Let's take a short break now but coming up we'll speak to some dalit voices on their reaction to the caste legislation being introduced in parliament stay tuned Welcome back As the move advances in Parliament to make caste discrimination unlawful, let's speak to some Ambedkarites on what kind of experiences they have had in Britain, and what the caste legislation might do, and what it might not. I take utmost care that I don't expose myself to that kind of a situation. So, if I do, then I would definitely be a, a, a victim of it. But uh, as I was growing up, I have seen my class teachers, my colleagues in the class. whoever knew about me i would see that there was a difference in their behavior and the way they treated me so i have been seeing that throughout my life and uh that's the reason i think that it's extremely important to get this legis- uh, legislation in place not because it it really stops for people from doing it forever but at least it gives me the sense of security it makes me feel good that even if they they may not stop but i have something to go back to and say that they they are doing this to me okay that that feeling is so relieving uh because someone who treats you very low is an extremely bad feeling it's uh i don't know if british i mean rather britain would understand the feeling but uh being an indian and being a part of that community i can say it's an it's a terrible feeling the people they were very senior in age they went to see the personal manager and said to him uh, excuse me mr ditoni his name was you made mr with the supervisor do you know that his four fathers used to work in our field do you ex- do you expect us to work under his supervision of course english man was not aware of the caste system and he called me in the office he said mr vidhi what is this i had people in my office and uh, um, so i explained to him she was um not cleaned by her cleaner because she said that you know she saw the photo of guru ravidas in the in the house therefore the cleaner said sorry i won't touch you there was another instance of untouchability where someone actually didn't put the change in the customer's hands so if you have untouchability which is explicitly prohibited in the indian constitution it begs belief that in a country like britain that even the word caste does not appear in the equality act 2010 there should be more studies which will take into consideration the new forms because caste has been a resilient phenomena cultural phenomena it is very um, rigid so it has to be studied in the new context i think uh, the casteism uh, which is a very into the fabric of indian culture and mindset doesn't go away that easily or because it's been there for over 2000 years with people and it's a it's a part of the hindu way of living and wherever we go irrespective of which country we go which place we live it comes with us because it comes with our religion it comes with our mindset that's how we have looked at things so even we stay in britain uh it doesn't let us forget all those things because it's a part of our life and that's that's the the only way to get rid of that is either you change the mindset of the people or till the time that happens you impose certain external restrictions which stops them from doing it and that's why i think it's required caste has been left out of the equality act 2010 for far too long 
And the reason why Dalit groups have been campaigning nonstop since possibly since they've been here since the 60s and the 70s is because caste was always a hidden factor amongst Asian diasporas. So after relentless campaigning from many Dalit groups, we have reached a situation now that the Equality Act was passed in 2010. It didn't mention caste. But then after a few years later in 2013, we had the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act which actually made a provision that caste can be included, must be included, within the Equality Act 2010 via secondary legislation. So all that the government needs to do now is pass that secondary legislation so that caste is a part of the Equality Act 2010. So it really beggars belief why the government isn't doing that. I think we should uh, study Dr. Ambedkar, his book, Annihilation of Caste, because he said when Indian will go from India, if they can't take full ship of their bad beliefs, bad habits, they will make sure they will take in the suitcase. They have done that exactly wherever they went, whether they went to Kenya, whether they went to Canada, America, UK, they are practicing caste system because we must not forget one thing. It is part of their religious scripture. That is why it is strong as when it was implemented when about, uh, uh, well, about 3,000 years ago when they came from Eurasia. So it is still strong because it is in the scripture. Earlier I thought that as you grow, you become more liberal, especially when you, are, when you have access to the kind of education that we have and the kind of a technology and when you, uh, especially when you are on, uh, on the platform where you, you can interact with people on the international level, you don't expect that. But I have, over a period of time, I have realized one thing that it's very difficult to get rid of those basic, you know, things that we have learned and seen our parents do that. And uh, maybe some of them are able to get rid of it, but not all. I think legislation that can do both, educate as well as legislate. If you ask someone not to practice caste, that doesn't mean that they are not going to practice caste. Caste is a state of mind. It is deeply rooted in tradition and also scriptures, religious scriptures, and therefore it must be eradicated with a, with a deterrent and with teeth. Therefore, I think legislation will shock people. It will also uh, scare people, caste supremacists, from practicing caste discrimination in this country, and it will also educate people. As a matter of fact, it will give them a the light of uh, understanding that how tolerant they are, it is a testing time for them. That how the British people are the tolerant themselves and what they have really taken in the world at large, that they have a chance that uh, how they behave and how they uh, help us to implement the legislation, which is inter well overdue and it has passed through the both the, I mean, the House of Lords twice and uh, it has got the majority in there as well. And uh, what is the point of delaying that? And what is the politics that we don't understand? Well, that's all for this week. Thanks for watching. But do stay tuned for news and daily updates.